to uh, uh, chapter 14 uh, in the uh, Gospel of John, and I'm just we'll read the first six verses, and then we'll have a word of prayer. Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Let's bow in prayer. Now, Lord, we need your help this morning. We have many distractions in our mind and uh, around us. And uh, many times the cares of the life, of life and, and other issues seem to crowd and, and uh, flood our minds so that we're not be able to think and able to hear. And so we need your help this morning. I pray for folks this morning. I pray for those who are sick. I pray, God, that, that you will heal them and raise them up. I pray for those that are having financial problems. I pray you'll help them. I pray for those having family difficulties. And Lord, we just need, uh, as we sang about the everlasting arms, we need to lean on them. We thank you that you've never failed anyone who put their trust in you. And so I pray this morning, I pray for our teenagers. I pray, God, you'll bless them. And I pray you'll help them as they try to make it through life and help them to find you and live for you. And then, Lord, we thank you for our workers, for the folks in the nurseries and the children's churches and the media ministry and the various ministries. I pray you'll bless them and, and bless their efforts in serving you. I pray that Christ will be glorified in this service. I pray you'll help folks in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to call your attention to verse 6 in this text where Jesus said, I am the way, <clears throat> the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Am I on right here, David? Okay. No man comes unto the Father but by me. The thing about the Lord Jesus Christ is he said many surprising things, things during his earthly ministry. For instance, he said the way to save your life is to lose it. And that is a paradox, but it is a, certainly a truth that many have discovered. Uh, he said the meek shall inherit the earth. He said those who are first will be last. He said for us to rejoice in persecution. He said to pray for your enemies. And he said it is better to give than to receive and to turn the other cheek when someone mistreats you. But by far the most outrageous assertion that Jesus ever made is found in verse 6 of our text when he declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. Now, this claim, I believe, upsets people like no other claim. It has been called arrogant. It has been called narrow-minded. It has been called bigoted and snobbish. And some folks who are professing Christians are those who are seeking to know the Lord find that it chafes them when they read this claim. And, uh, and for some, it becomes a stumbling block. But I believe that Jesus Christ is telling the truth. I believe that uh, when he said it, he said it out of compassion. He said it out of concern. And uh, I think maybe it is the most single important statement, perhaps, in all the Bible. Uh, not only to our planet, but to you personally. But now, why is it so controversial? I think one reason is it strikes at the core of three myths about religion. Uh, and we're going to address those as we move along. And I think the first myth that, we'll, that religion uh, that we hear is that all religions are the same. I'm sure you've heard that. You've heard people say that. And on the surface, it may be true that they have a lot of things in common. But... Uh, when it comes to the fundamentals and the essentials, uh, you will find that they do not teach the same thing. Um, but there are those that say it really doesn't matter what you believe or which teaching you follow. Um, in other words, 
they basically say that all ro roads lead to heaven and uh, that all religions basically are teaching the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man and uh, but the the thing about Christianity is Bible Christianity cannot be reconciled with the other religions of the world and the re reason for that is the uniqueness of Christianity and that uniqueness is founded or based in the uniqueness of Jesus Christ you see religious leaders say follow me and I will show you the way Jesus Christ said I am the way religious leaders say uh, follow me and I'll show you the light Jesus Christ said I am the light religious leaders say follow me and I will teach you the truth Jesus Christ said I am the truth and so you'll see that before this service is over that it is absolutely impossible to reconcile Christianity with the other religions of the world it's impossible and uh, for instance, there's, I believe that there are drastic and irreconcilable differences between Christianity and the other belief systems. You see, every other religious system on this planet uh, is based on people doing something. In other words, through struggle and striving, uh, one can find favor with God and hopefully enter into heaven. Uh, Martin Luther, you know of the Lutheran Church, it does exist. And it exists because it had a founder. And the founder of the Lutheran Church was Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a dedicated Roman Catholic. He was a Catholic monk. And he was very dedicated. He read and, and, uh, and could write about seven different languages if you question his education. Martin Luther was a brilliant man. He challenged uh, an entire continent. And he wrote his 95 theses and nailed it on the church door uh, and challenged them and uh, Martin Luther when he fell under conviction he'd been reading the book of Romans and uh, he was on his knees going up St. Peter's going up the steps kissing each step as he went up walking up those steps on his knees that he might merit grace from God and be accepted by God and somewhere along that journey something he'd read in the book of Roman burned into his conscience and the verse was this the just shall live by faith and he said I went back to my study like a madman and tore through the book of Romans and I discovered and realized that all of my works and my efforts could never save me that salvation is a free gift and thus he challenged the Pope and of course had to flee to Germany if you know uh, to save his life because there was a reward out on his head in other words, all other religions other than Christianity teach that we either appease our God, please Him, or accepted by Him through our struggles. There are people who use the Tibetan prayer wheel in order to try to get answers from whatever God there may be. There are those that take pilgrimages to some sacred shrine. And by the way, there is no such thing as a sacred shrine. You need to get over sacred places. There's no holy ground. There's no holy land. And uh, there's no holy father. And there's no holy smoke. And there's no, no holy cow. There's none of that. Only Christ is holy. And you ought to be holy if he lives in you. And so we've got to get over this idea that people can take journeys and go somewhere that's more spiritual than, than any other. There's no such thing. So you may have a nice feeling and interpret that feeling as this being a spiritual place. Uh, there are those that feel that if they give to the poor, that God will be pleased with them, and they will merit a place in heaven. There are those that feel if they abstain from certain foods and, and uh, observe certain diets. Uh, that would really leave me out. I mean, any relig religion that forbids me to eat, I just wouldn't have anything to do with it, because my favorite Bible verse is, Rise, kill, and eat. You know? <laughs> There are those that teach you have to pray in a specific manner and say specific prayers in order to merit God's grace. And so you can tune in occasionally and all over this country this morning there are people gathered together repeating the same prayer over and over and over and over and over and over it and they're repeating it from the cradle to the grave. 
You know why they're uh, repeating that prayer? They are trying to merit favor with God. They're trying to store up grace so that when they die, they don't stay too long in purgatory. That's what it's all about. It is effort in trying to merit grace and get favor with God. So you're going to see in just a moment that Christianity, Bible Christianity, cannot be reconciled with any other religion on the place of the planet. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Amen. And so uh, uh, there are those that say that, you know, you have to go through a series of reincarnations. I've been to India several times. One of the most pathetic things I've ever seen is, uh, you know, is, is, is folks sitting, starving themselves together, torturing themselves, running wires and hooks, and hanging from their body, hanging from, from trees with, by their flesh, and uh, crawling on the ground, and standing for hours and hours, in one, for days in one place without moving. All of this is to try to please the gods. And believe me, I India has more gods than people. I'm not, I'm not just jesting, that's the truth. And they're trying to please these gods so that in their next cycle, they don't come out some lower creature like a mosquito or a cow or a pig or a mouse. Now, if you doubt what I say, then you don't know what you're talking about. All you need to do is check it out, and you'll find that that's what they believe. They believe in reincarnation, and it's a cycle over and over and over, and hopefully through self-abasement and denial, you will be elevated to a higher level. You get the picture. All of this is completely contrary to what Jesus Christ taught. Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ is God reaching out to us. What man tries to do is reach out to God through his good works, his self-righteousness, his self-effort. But in the Bible, it is God who reaches out to man. Jesus Christ said, I came to seek and to save the lost. You are not seeking him, he's seeking you. There's a great song that says he was there all the time. I like that song, beautiful song. He was patiently waiting in line, standing there all the time. And Christ said, all day long have I stretched forth my hands to a disobedient and a, and, a, and a gainsaying people. You see, it is God who's seeking you. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And had, if God had not moved in our direct, direction, we would have always remained in darkness. And so it is not us trying to gain the favor of God or the gods or the gods. It is God himself who moved in our direction. And this is what he did in Jesus Christ. And we're all guilty of wrongdoing. We know that. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that they do wrong. Your own experience tells you that. Everybody knows what it is to feel distant from God or to, to uh, feel that they are cut off from God. Your experience tells you that. And someone must pay the penalty for our sin. You believe people ought to pay for their crimes. What about you? Should you pay for yours? I mean, you've lied. You believe, you believe that it's wrong to lie, don't you? At least you believe it's wrong for people to lie to you. See? And God says all men are liars. The Bible says a child is just a few days old and goes forth speaking lies. They're not far out of the nursery. In fact, I think they lie before they get out of there. They say... I won't run away, and you open the door and they run away. But you see, we've got a problem with lying. You see, but lying only bothers us when somebody else lies to us. You see? And lying, envious, you envy other people. You say bad things about other people. You, you envy what other folks have. You're jealous of many folks. You see? And so there's just a whole host of sins down inside our heart, and, and they have to be dealt with. Now, we try to deal with them through religion. People try to deal with those things through some of the things I've mentioned. But the way God deals with them is He forgives them. God pays for them Himself, and He forgives you your sins. See, I, uh, uh, there's a, uh, you know, the thing about other religions is spelled D-O, do, and ours is D-O-N-E, done. It's done for us. You know, there's a, uh, in, uh, in Buddhist literature, there's a story of a parable. There's a story or a parable about a runaway son. And it somewhat parallels the parable of the runaway son in the Gospels of, uh, of Luke. 
And in these two stories, in the Buddha story, when the boy came back home, uh, the response was that this boy would have to work for several years uh, as a penalty to pay for his misdeeds. But in the story Jesus told when the boy came home, the father was waiting for him with open arms, ran to meet him and kissed him, fell on his neck, and said, bring hither the best robe and put the robe on him, put shoes on his feet and put a ring on his hand and a chain of gold about his neck. And he said, kill the fatted calf and let's have a party and let's welcome my son home for he was lost and is found and dead and alive. I mean, there's absolutely no comparison with these two parables in the way that the father responded. Buddha taught that the, that the person was going to have to work for years to pay off his misdeed. Jesus Christ said that the boy is to be forgiven and welcome home. And that is what Christianity does. In Islam, very popular religion, it's getting some attention. Did you know Islam doesn't believe that Jesus died on the cross for you? Now they believe in Jesus Christ. They believe that Jesus existed. And many of them believe he was born of a virgin birth. But no Muslim believes Jesus Christ ever died on the cross. Not one. They don't believe that Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh. To them, that's idolatry. They call it having partners with God. So they do not believe that Jesus Christ was deity, and they don't believe he died on the cross, thus there was no resurrection, and that your sins are never paid for. You pay for your sins through ultimate sacrifice. Some have suggested that Buddha may not have even believed in God. And so all religions are not the same. And, uh, but Jesus Christ qualified himself to say, follow me, uh, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. There are those that say, follow me and I'll show you the way of life. Now then also... Uh, I don't believe there's any way of reconciling the difference between Christianity and uh, and um, um, and Christianity and and the other religions. Now the third thing here is that a second thing is that there's just one philosophy among many. They'll say that Christianity is one philosophy among many, and that uh, it's only as valid as other religions. In other words, some will say, if there are any differences between religions, they all have equal claims of the truth. You know, you have your truth and I have my truth. And I, this, this myth has an appeal to people today because of the pluralism in our society. I was sitting the other day in the living room looking out at a, a Ford Explorer, and it's, it, to me it looked bright red. But as I was thinking about what I was seeing and about what you hear in, in philosophy and in our culture, I really have to admit that I don't know if it's red or not. In fact, if someone look, has been taught from birth that it's black, then to them it's black. And if someone else over here has been taught that it's white, then to them when they look at it, it's white. And the idea here is that there is no truth, no ultimate truth. It's only what is true to you. And so basically, I went away not knowing for sure what color it was. You get the picture? If I ex embrace that philosophy, I can't possibly know what color that vehicle is. I just have to call the police and say, well, to me, it appears red. But I'm just not sure how it's going to look to you guys when you find it. It's just your judgment. Now, you wouldn't use that logic in a million years, but you use it about truth, you see. And what it is, it's an escape mechanism. And so folks say, well, if what is truth to, the, to these folks is truth to them, and what is truth to you is truth to you, and what is truth over here is truth over here. And so truth is just a relative thing. Well, that would be true if you couldn't depend on the credibility of Jesus Christ. That wouldn't be true in un, under, under any circumstances, basically. But uh, we, what we do is we confuse the idea that we have freedom to believe anything we want to, and that freedom supposedly makes something true. And so in our society, you have a right to believe anything you want to believe. And I, I, I agree, I like that. I do not want to be in a culture where beliefs are dictated, and I don't think you do either. 
But on the other hand, just because we have freedom of choice, it doesn't mean that the choice is correct. Just because your beliefs are protected by the law doesn't mean that that law is correct. I'll give you an example. We'll see where we're at. Back in the 40s, if you were in Germany, it was legal to round up Jews and bar them into the ghetto until they starved to death. Now, was it right or wrong? Well, it was legal. And the society there accepted it. And not too many years ago, in this country, there were certain drinking fountains that said for whites only. Now those were back before my day, but I know they existed. It was the law, by the way. Now was it right or was it wrong? There was a time when blacks could not vote. Society accepted it was against the law for them to vote. And they got arrested for it. So the law was there. So was it right or wrong? And then, you know, there were certain places they couldn't enter, certain uh, uh, restaurants they couldn't enter, and certain places they couldn't set. It was the law. I'm glad those laws have been ab uh, abolished because I think they were wicked. But they're still, they were still the law. And when you start letting society decide what is right and what is wrong, you're headed for disaster. There must be a basis for truth. If you don't have a basis for truth, then if we all vote in here to, that you're the wrong color, then you're in trouble. Or if society votes it, when you get past 70 years of age or 60 years of age, you're to be sent to the dog kennel, you know, and then they'll give you a shot. So you have to have truth. And truth cannot be based on the whelms of society. And that's what's going on in this country today. I'm telling you, that's why judges can make decisions from the bench and change the laws. And our culture has bought into it. And they assume that because they have a right, it must be truth. And you young people need to wake up to that. Because if you just think that through where that's going, that heads to disaster. It heads to totalitarianism and, and, and slavery. And so Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You have a right to say that. But it wouldn't be true. Now how do you decide if what somebody says is true or false? Well, you have to look at their credentials. Jesus said, destroy this body or this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. He did that. On the third day he arose and appeared to over 500 people at once. You could say the same thing. We would stand at the tomb and I suspect you'd still be there. So you could say it. You have the right to say it. But you don't have the power and the ability to fulfill it. He did. And so his credentials spoke for him. I don't know if you saw Gibson's The Passion of Christ or not. But if you did, you saw Judas take the 30 pieces of silver and throw them down in the temple. And then they went and they bought a potter's field, if you remember, and he hung himself and, and the rope finally broke and he fell down into the fields, called the field of blood. Now, what happened is this text is prophesied in the Old Testament. I want you to go to the book of Zechariah, next to the last book in the Old Testament. And go to Zechariah chapter, um, chapter 11. And this may be one of the most, uh, well actually this was written 400 years before Jesus Christ was ever born. Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 13. Actually look at verse 12. And I said to them, if you think good of me, uh, think good, give me my price. Zechariah 11, 12. And I said unto them, if you think good of me, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it into the potter, a goodly price that I was uh, appraised at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Now what this text is saying is that Zechariah was instructed of the Lord 
to tell the people to give their evaluation of him. And what they did is they came back with 30 pieces of silver as how they, pray, they, 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 how they prized the Lord. And the 30 pieces of silver, according to the book of Exodus, is the price of a slave. But here is a prophecy that prophesied exactly what Judas would do. Judas received the value of how he praised or prized Jesus Christ. He said, give me 30 pieces of silver and I will betray him into your hands. And so they made an agreement, gave him 30 pieces of silver. In the garden, he kissed Jesus on the cheek. That was the signal to take him and arrest him and have him crucified. Judas realized that he had betrayed innocent blood and he took the 30 pieces of silver and threw it down on the temple floor and tried to give it back. They wouldn't have it. It was blood money. So they took it and they bought a field. It was the potter's field. And it became a place of burial. It was blood money, the, battle, the place of blood. Now, my point is this, is that Jesus Christ fulfilled Old Testament prophecies. And these prophecies gave him his credentials. For instance, Jesus performed great miracles that further authenticated his claims of being God. He healed, he opened the eyes of the blind, Isaiah chapter 29. He made the lame to walk, Isaiah, 3, uh, Isaiah 35, 6. He, cured, he uh, healed the lepers and cleansed them in Isaiah 61. He opened the ears of the deaf in Isaiah 29. He raised the dead in Isaiah chapter 11. And the gospel was preached to the poor as prophesied in Isaiah 1, uh, uh, verse 2. In other words, Jesus Christ had the credentials to back up what he said about who he was. And if you don't have any credentials about what you say, it doesn't make any difference what you say. Jesus fulfilled his own prediction by being resurrected from the dead. He made it very clear that he said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart. Let's turn to Psalm 16. Back in Psalm chapter 16. And uh, here is a prophecy concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, this was written some thousand years before Jesus was ever born. Look at Psalm 16. And verse 10 will be enough. For thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. Well, when a body is in the grave, over three days it begins to corrupt. Lazarus was in of just about that period of time. But Jesus was in the grave three days and three nights. And here is one prophecy that predicted that he would never be, he'd never see corruption, but that he would be resurrected. And so Christianity isn't just a philosophy, it's a reality. And again, it's based on the merits of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, the third merit is Christians are narrow-minded and snobbish when they say that Jesus is the only way to heaven. You see, this is what I said at the beginning. There are folks who don't mind saying that our Bible is just one of many, and that our belief is just one of many, but that when you begin to say that any one is right, then people begin to get their dandruff up. Because the idea today is that nobody is absolutely right, and we're absolutely certain of that. See? And that's the only right thing we know, is that nobody's right. See? And you know, if there were many paths to God, if there were multiple ways to God, and then we said, no, our way is the only way, then that would be bigoted. It would be uh, snobbish and so on. Because there would be multiple ways, and, but we would be singling ours out. But what we've been contending for the, for the period of time is that there aren't multiple ways. Over the years, we've had, we've had a lot of babies born around here. They weren't born in this building, thank God. But our mothers, uh, they have their babies. And, and occasionally, sometimes, just a very few times, uh, they'll, there'll be a young baby, and you'll find out that it has jaundice. The baby's skin turns yellow the white of the eyes turn yellow 
and the parents take the baby into the pediatrician and he looks at it and he diagnoses and tells what the problem is and he says here's what you need to do and you need to make this baby plenty of light put a light over this child and make sure it gets plenty of sunshine and light and there's something about the light because jaundice is a liver problem but there's something about the light that brings about the cure and restores the health now let's suppose that you took your baby into this pediatrician and he gave you this uh, remedy and you said well you know doctor I can appreciate that you have your truth and I have my truth and uh, I, just, I like mine better so I think we're gonna put them in the basement or you might say well grandma has left some remedies I found it in some notes in the you know in the suitcase and grandma has some old home remedies and that was her truth and so you would never use that kind of logic but the reason you wouldn't use that logic is because of the experience and the credentials of this physician you trust him that's why you're there he has perhaps the credentials somewhere on the wall there are those who've recommended him and his success rate is enough to help you cause you to go there and trust him you understand it's the credentials that causes you to accept this as truth and you don't rely on your own truth you rely on someone who is reliable and I'm telling you that you have a sin problem I have a sin problem and I need to go to the great physician who can diagnose my problem and when he does he says you know what you need is you need plenty of light and the entrance of thy word giveth light Christ said I am the light of the world and he said I am the way the truth and the life and his credentials I believe uh, qualify him to say that and make that statement I uh, people talk about Christianity being uh, you know bigoted and narrow and snobbish well let me just give you one more illustration we'll be through let's suppose you have these two clubs country clubs over here in order to become a member of this one you have to pass a certain intellectual test there's a certain standard you have to reach not only that there are certain things you must do before you can become a member you have to fulfill certain obligations and if you're not able to fulfill those obligations you cannot become a member on the other hand you've got a club over here that says over the door membership absolutely free membership has been paid in full and the door stays open and all in their literature everybody is welcome there's nothing that you have to achieve there's nothing that you have to earn you simply have to want be a part of it because somebody has paid the price and this is what Jesus Christ did Jesus Christ paid the price of the sins of the whole world and he invites people to come and you know you have to be careful because we you see the heart is deceitful and we're looking for excuses not to trust Christ we're looking for alibis on how can I get out of this and your mind goes to work and you start conjuring up these things well you know this is what everybody believes you know and everybody believes that and I knew so and so they were a hypocrite and tried this and it didn't work and we've always got these wheels turning so that we don't have to to trust Jesus as our Savior because the truth is we're enemies of our own salvation and God has to overcome that the truth is about Christians is we're just beggars who found some food and we're trying to tell other beggars where it's at and that's all it is but it's up to you to decide if you are going to accept the claims and the credibility of Jesus Christ you know I don't have a time but let me show you something here these are just a few these are just a few just a very few of the general prophecies in the Old Testament three pages I have here and uh, and two columns one on each side these are just prophecies in the Old Testament that are crystal clear that were fulfilled in the New Testament I only gave you two or two or three but there are hundreds of them and it is fulfilled prophecy that gives Jesus Christ his credentials 
No other world leader can do that. I'm going to close this right here. But let me ask you this. What did Joseph Smith do for you? Think about it. I'm not, pick, I'm not trying to pick on Bud, but I'm going to, I guess I have to. What did Joseph Smith ever do for you? What did Muhammad ever do for you? What did Buddha ever do for you? What did the Pope of Rome ever do for you? You know what you have to say in every case? Nothing. He could give me teachings, but he did nothing for me. But ask me what Jesus Christ ever did for me. What he did for me? He went to the cross and died for me. You know what he did while he was on the cross? He prayed for my forgiveness. You know what he did after that? He arose from the dead. You know what he did after that? He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. You know what he did after that? He raised up apostles and gave me my Bible. You know what he did? When I was 17 years old, he came into my heart and saved me. That's what Jesus did for me. And he's not through doing what he's going to do for me. Because one of these days, he's coming back for me. He said, if I go away, I will come again. His credentials qualifies him to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Now listen.